I'm really happy to have uh, Christine Boardman here speaking. Uh, she's, I, I'm sure many of you know her or know of her. She's the Distinguished Professor and Presidential Chair in Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, her book, uh, her recent book, Big Data, Little Data, No Data Scholarship in the Network World, uh, won the 2016 Prose Award in com uh, Computer and Information Study uh, Science. She's the co-chair of the CoData Task Group on Data Citation. She chaired the Task Force on Cyber Learning for the NSF. Um, and she currently directs the Center for Knowledge Infrastructure at UCLA, along with being a fellow on AAAS and a, a million other things. She's got a very, very long Wikipedia entry, which I think is something we can all aspire to maybe someday. Um, and uh, and I think that it, it gives me enormous pleasure to be able to have asked her and to have her uh, accept um, uh, to come talk at uh, Earth this Q meeting. I think we all have a lot to learn from her, her experiences and her uh, deep thinking on uh, concepts of data citation, data management um, and information sciences uh, here today and I hope uh, you all enjoy her talk. Uh, you can, she's got a Twitter handle, so if you are tweeting, I'm going to keep pitching that out. <laughs> so, Christine, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. It's wonderful to be here, and we've worked with the Earth Science community for over oh, 15 to 20 years now, and uh, John Delaney is here also, your keynote for tomorrow morning, and we've had a, a long uh, talk about some of these issues, and we will be as synergistic between today and tomorrow as, as we possibly uh, possibly can be. Uh, so let me start with kind of a big picture. I've, my approach is to talk about the information infrastructure, and given that, uh, just as we've heard in the morning, that there's a lot of the pressure is on, the time is on, it's certainly timely to be thinking uh, much more specifically about the system of systems and what kind of knowledge infrastructure uh, you're going to build for the earth sciences writ large and how all these pieces are going to come together. Uh, we started in looking at data and data practices uh, in geography data, particularly physical uh, geography data in the late 1990s and started in 2002. I was one of the founding uh, co-PIs of the Center for Embedded Network Sensing in the NSF Science Technology Center. So we've been working in a variety of areas there. We also work in astronomy, in um, uh, space sciences, and in biomedical sciences. So we're not a big group, but we cover a lot of space and have, have a, pretty big, a pretty big footprint. So here's uh, one of the reasons, one of the really driving reasons, why we're having this conversation today. There's a movement around the world toward much more open access to data and open access to publication. It's been in uh, US policy since the Holdren memo in 2012. The National Science Foundation Data Management Plan started even before that. The European Union and European Commission have made open access to publications and data uh, to be the norm in, within a very uh, few years. And uh, for those of you, how many of you were at the uh, Research Data Alliance meeting in Barcelona in April? Several of you were. Yeah, a, a good number of you were there also and heard um, Augusto's uh, framing keynote where they're already thinking about the next seventh framework pro uh, program, which will run from 2021 to 2028. And they know everyone is going to have data problems and they don't want to solve them 6,000 times for 6,000 different projects. And I think it's the same with NSF with NIH, with Department of Energy, with the various other kinds of funding in the US about coordinating these things. How do we think big? How do we think together? How do we scale the data management problems and build the right kind of infrastructure? The earth sciences are probably the most obvious place to start. Uh, our astronomers are often telling us or reminding us that there's only one sky that they reference. And the earth scientists are telling us that we only have one Earth and one planet that we need to take care of. The Earth has, as those of you in the room know far better than I, many, many interacting complex systems. Observation data can be, co uh, can be collected once and only once. You can't get yesterday's weather uh, today or today's weather tomorrow. 
you want to be able to uh, get the data as you acquire them and then accumulate them, keep them in ways that you can use previous data to predict future data and you can begin to bring them together for questions that we don't yet know how to ask. And that, that's the really hard part. People in the information sciences and um, particularly the archival scientists like to say that our users have not been born yet. And that's really difficult when you talk about things like scientific data. <clears throat> what are some of the arguments that we see around uh, why we should be sharing and releasing data? These were the ones that I mined from the various international programs and requirements for uh, increasing access to data. The reproducibility one is what you hear the most, and in many ways it's the most problematic. And I'll come back and talk about that with respect to earth science data later. The second one you also hear around the world that uh, the public, whether it's tax dollars, tax euros, um, you name it, has invested in this kind of science and they don't want to see the data locked up in lab servers, locked up in proprietary journals, supplemental information, and so on, that more people should have access to it for the long term. To leverage those investments, it's expensive to collect data. Can we get more science out of the data that we've collected by reusing them? And then cumulatively and more generally, this idea of advancing research and innovation by bringing data together from multiple sources and multiple places. Now, no one present, uh, pretends that's an easy problem. We know that it's hard to do. We have some answers for each of these things. These are well studied in the social studies of science that uh, generally you get hired and promoted for those publications rather than beautiful, elegant data sets. Uh, some people do get a lot of credit for data sets. It depends on the kind of science and how they're made. It's a different kind of expertise to build metadata and provenance and document those data. We are trying to educate a new generation of data scientists, data librarians, data archivists who work directly with the science community and as early as possible in the science process to, to coordinate and to assist. There's ways around the, competi the competition and priority issues. We're seeing areas in biosciences and biomedicine, for example, where frontline basic scientists are working with pharmaceutical companies in ways that everyone can have their cake and eat it too, that they can release data for a wide usage, including for business usage, at the same time it becomes the basic material that goes into science and nature and cell. So there are ways to partner these. The control and the ownership is probably the most difficult one, and again, I'll come back to that, because it's not always clear when data are something you can own, when they're facts that can't be copyrighted, how licensing works, and that gets very messy. So when should we be thinking about investing in data? Well, everywhere. This, uh, this chart from the library world, and it's probably a little too neat and a little too, uh, a little too elegant, that suggests we have this virtuous circle. We collect data, we put it in the process, it gets reused, it flows back into the, into the research farther on. Uh, it's certainly nice to think that the world works quite that neatly, but generally uh, there's a lot of leakage in this process. At the other extreme, depending on where you stand, this one comes out of a business and finance office from the University of Michigan. <coughs> It says, the way we do data is uh, we, we come up with a project, we find funding for it, we manage it, do the proposal, and when it's done, we close it out. And if you're a finance officer, that's about as far as it gets. And that's certainly you know, part of where, where NSF sits. There's, the data's not in there anyplace. What happens to data at the other end? So, and, and also some of the human subjects at Wharton will think, it, will think of a project this way and not think about that continuity, the kind of thing we really want to get from here to there. So what we want is knowledge infrastructures, and that's why we've called our group at UCLA the Center for Knowledge Infrastructures, and there's a number of us around the US and other parts of the world who are using this, this phrase to think much beyond information infrastructure, beyond uh, cyber infrastructure, to think not just about the technical, but about the social, the practical, the organizational, scientific, how all these pieces should come together. This uh, particular chart is from uh, Alyssa Goodman at Harvard, who's one of our 
collaborators, she runs a group called Seamless Astronomy. And this one is also very elegant, more elegant than most of uh, the work really turned out to be. She's got Vermeer's astronomer there in the middle. What I like about this is she wraps around the scientist the, the data, the publications, but then the software and the tools and the other parts of infrastructure. Astronomy, which we've been working with for a decade or so, has a, one of the most complete sets of knowledge infrastructure of any field we've found. They do have a common way they bring together the publications. Those are indexed to the objects in the sky, uh, in, our, in our galaxy and beyond. And those, in turn, are linked to many of the observational data sets as well. They brought the pieces together. But in fact, uh, knowledge infrastructure is much messier than all of that. Uh, it's got certain amounts of string and bailing wire and pieces. And I think a bit of what you've heard already from Kirsten, from Mohan, from uh, Eva, and others is that what we need to do is not just build from scratch. We need to bring the pieces together. And there's certainly parts of the infrastructure for the earth sciences, the geosciences already in place. Uh, and how do you knit those together and build upon them? It's uh, we don't have time to start over. You've got an installed base. You need to work with where people are and where they need to be and how to get from here to there. Uh, that, that's sort of how we want to build going forward. The challenges often come down to what are the data in the first place. And this is where uh, we've spent most of our time as uh, we are social scientists and we are technical scientists at the same time. My group has, has quite a broad uh, breadth of exp expertise and uh, experience. And we try to understand what are the data in the first place and how those fit together and how they change across, across different communities. This very simplified model is one that, that you tend to see, not quite as much as uh, when Wired Magazine was talking about the long tail about 10 years or so ago. The difficulty with this one is it's, it's highly reductionist. It sort of reduces everything about data and about science to two simple flat dimensions. Although, you know, even the earth sciences, it's, you know, it's a useful starting point to think about you've got a few people who have massive amounts of data and most people who have much more, uh, much more scarce data, smaller amounts. And the ones we've worked with in, in bed network sensing and biology and earth sciences, the, we have the ones who are doing satellite mapping. They have large amounts of data. And then we work with the ones who are literally up their rear, rear ends in swamps, uh, lots of mosquitoes, if not alligators, uh, but, you know, digging up lots of little things. And those are very hard won data. And somehow we need to bring all of those together in a useful way. The scaling problem is something I think all of you are familiar with. Something that works well for your own lab or your own group is not necessarily something that works for the lab or the group next door, much less the lab or the group in another country. This uh, three-dimensional set of uh, criteria for big data comes from the business world. It's also about 15 years old. And it says that volume, the amount of data you've got, is just one component that contributes to the complexity. The variety, the heterogeneity, and that's certainly something with earth sciences data, you've got massively heterogeneous data. You've got physical samples. You've got uh, sensor networks. You've got uh, mud and wind and earth and all the rest of it. And you're trying to make sense of all those pieces. It also may come, come at you at very high velocity if you've got streaming data, uh, time series data, and so on. We're looking at other scale factors in addition to those. We find that the volume of data is often the least important when it comes to complexity and people's ability to manage them. Some of the others are the temporal characteristics. Again, you're often dealing with climate models where you've got very old kinds of data and you want to predict long in the future. You've got spatial data. You're covering large areas. You may be covering the entire globe. Uh, that you've got to you've got to map, and personnel. Some of you are working alone or with a graduate student or two. Some of you are heading very large centers, and you're working with multiple agencies for multiple kinds of funding. So these are a whole array of kinds of complexities that come together to try to deal with these kinds of these kinds of data. This is where I ended up after you know, 15 years or so of thinking about data and data practices. 
which is a pretty much a phenomenological approach to thinking about data. And to recognize that pretty much anything can be data. It can be, you know, the air we breathe, the mud on our shoes, uh, many things in this room are data to some of you. But it's when you start to treat them as evidence of some phenomena, that's when they become data. And that also is where the challenges arise when you've got people from multiple disciplines, multiple domains working together and trying to ask, uh, ask complementary kinds of questions. So let me give you a few examples. I'm, I've chosen examples just from our, our earth science work. This, the, this is the center that we spent uh, 10 years with. About uh, two thirds or more of the people were from computer science and engineering and the rest were from different kinds of science uh, application areas. A mix of seismology, uh, biology, oceanography, and other kinds of earth sciences and then uh, towards the later part of the center, we moved into some areas such as uh, biomedical sciences and, and health sciences and health platforms, and also shifted from building new kinds of technology. The center started by thinking about smart dust and ended up uh, thinking about cell phones as ubiquitous sensor networks that, that could be used in new ways. So as you can see, they put sensors in 3D frameworks uh, where you could run cables up and down and move you know, much more like those towers for the, the carbon flux networks. Uh, we had things with boats, we had robots, we had buoys in the lakes, uh, and then ways to sort of burst these up to, up to satellites as needed. A lot of good technology went on uh, in the sensor networks themselves, as well as the science. So these people were coming together, and they were, the, the computer science and engineers were trying to build new tools to improve science, and the, the participating scientists wanted these, these new kinds of tools. So we would go out um, and follow them around, and my students um, fell into quicksand, and uh, Matt Mayernick climbed the, uh, climbed the Andes laying a seismic transect as a part of his dissertation work. And these are some of the things that we found you know, working side by side. When we interviewed engineers, we would get examples like this. The temperature is temperature. If you get the same reading today and tomorrow and the next day, they were happy that their sensors were working. And that made sense and that was something that they could publish from. The biologists that we talked to had a very different notion of what was temperature. Uh, this was a group that were working up in the James Reserve, uh, one of the UCMAC reserve sites, where they would run the same instrument side by side for 365 days before they would trust what that temperature measurement was. Very different ways of thinking about the science, but the result was that the measurements that that engineer got could not be published in a biology journal because it didn't meet their standards. And it, they weren't really realizing this that much until we came in and started asking them lots of questions and it got them to reflect and think about new ways. Now, neither of these was wrong. They were certainly correct with respect to their own domain, to their own discipline. But it says when you want to bring data together, you've got to find some kind of kitchen language, some kind of common language, and realize what the right level of abstraction is going to be so that you can merge data and people can read each other. All too often, we found that for the groups in SENSE to share data, the, the MATLAB group had his, its way of doing something, the R group had its way, and they might take them all down to Excel spreadsheets or the CSV files to be able to exchange them, losing a great deal of information in the process. But it became the lowest common denominator. This is another uh, paper that we put out, what, 10 years ago was the first time that, that we drew this map. Julian Wallace of, of our group uh, drew this. And let me just call your attention to the, the different parts of this. The center part in the middle, the one that says sensor collected application data. So we're just examples of the kinds of science measurements. Of course, what they're really getting was voltage, and they could use that to determine what the presence of nitrate. People were working for methylmercury contamination uh, in rice fields and so on. That's what everybody wanted, and that's the group that did consider those to be data. The, at the bottom, you've got that manually collected application data. Those were the biologists who still had to dip some water out of a lake and uh, get it to the right pH level, centrifuge it, and then compare that to the data coming off the sensor networks. 
you know, we have very senior scientists working with us. They could eyeball like, they could tell you roughly what the pH level was. They could tell you what the concentration was of a particular algae if they were looking at uh, harmful algal blooms. So that was their, their validation, their criteria. The yellow here on, on the right, the performance data, that's what the electrical engineers were interested in. They wanted to know what the awake time was, the uptime, the downtime. They used the science information in the middle to validate or to, or to um, as, as their sort of their baseline criterion for, for ground truthing, whether they were going to trust it. Basically, they were abstracting away the science to see if the sensor network worked. On the left side, it was in now purple, the proprioceptive data, those were the robotics people. And they were adapting often weapons algorithms to find a target to direct a robot to the right place in the water to find where a bloom might be occurring or something else might be occurring. Again, they needed that science data in the middle to know how to direct it. They needed real application to know if their algorithms were working, but they abstracted the way, away the science. So this is an example to say these people are all working together in the field side by side, days, weeks, months at a time. And at the end of the day, they each took their data, what they considered to be data, home to their own labs. They processed it in their own ways. And you could never reproduce that experiment because it's, it's a different thing to a data to them and much, much intermediate processing between. So this is part of the challenge that you deal with in building infrastructures. We've been working with C. Debbie. I believe there's some people from C. Debbie here. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, and particularly with the group at USC and with the uh, IODP group at uh, at AM, and then some of this data is also being uh, worked through from the National Supercomputer Center and this, uh, some of our astronomy data at uh, Illinois. So again, this is a 10-year uh, science and engineering center from NSF. <laughs> And they invite us to come work with them uh, to help them in thinking about what kind of infrastructure they are trying to build. So this is a highly multidisciplinary group that's studying the microbial communities on the sea floor and uh, the IODP, the International Ocean Drilling Program, now Ocean Discovery Program, is the primary source of their data. Now, again, in interviewing these people, and Peter Darch from our team has done most of the field work for this. Uh, what you see is a huge range of domain scientists, and they're using different methods. They have PhDs in different areas. They're asking different kinds of questions. It's a relatively emergent domain. The physical scientists have been on the IODP boats for much longer than uh, the biological scientists have, and they end up with these cores where this would be kind of you know, a library in our world uh, for later science if anything's done with them. And some of the things that uh, makes sense for this group is you know if they can reuse these data to increase the access to a community which had very sparse uh, amounts of data they can address more complex questions and particularly if you can get some baselines and build some reference collections you know those those are the things that they would accomplish Peter also drew uh, drew this chart to look at the divide divergence of data because the physical science data is more consistent and has been part of the IDP program longer, much more of the initial characterization of those cores takes place for the physical science on board ships than for the microbiological. They have to do a lot more post-processing uh, once they get it to their labs. Now, one of the things that was very striking to us, maybe not to, you know, to the rest of you, is when we learned that to do physical science on these cores, uh, they could store them at minus four degrees centigrade. To do the biological work, they need to store them at minus 80 centigrade. So those decisions that you make very early in the scientific process will determine much of what you can do later. Now the cores are split, they're stored different places, at least you've got them, but you can't go back to something stored at minus four and do biological work on it a year later, a, a decade later, like you could in, in the other way. And we see some of the things in astronomy and the other fields we've studied too, they make decisions very early that have long consequences. So these are some of the factors that we've found that seem to matter in getting the data practices, getting the data management uh, 
working in these groups of study is how abundant the data are versus how scarce they are. The more abundant data, people are more willing to share. We certainly see this in astronomy where you've got vastly more data coming off these telescopes than anyone can make sense of. As they say, there might be 10,000 more things that go bump in the night than they have astronomers who can look at them. So they're very happy to put those data out there and get the school kids from around the world to investigate them. And some, and some very important discoveries have been made in astronomy by, uh, by novices and amateur scientists. The discovery-driven versus um, hypothesis-driven seems to matter considerably. And it's one that I think does not seem to have gotten as much attention, particularly in areas of social studies science, which is you know, some kinds of science are going to be inherently exploratory and discovery-driven. You've got little bits of data. You're trying to figure out the methods as you go along. From the outside, it may look like something more ad hoc than it really is. But you've got to be able to have the flexibility to keep asking new questions in new places and make decisions once you're out in the field. Other kinds of sciences, you can do much more hypothesis-driven science. You've got larger amounts of data to work with. You've got a longer history of methods. You've got more commonality of practices. Uh, and we certainly see that in astronomy, for example, where it takes 10 years or more to build an instrument and you also spend that same 10 years coming up with the kind of data management uh, that you need to do. <coughs> Some of these areas that we're studying are trying to move toward more, more hypothesis-driven science, uh, but at the risk of kind of hardening their standards and hardening their practices a little too soon, uh, want to think that they can move their, their science kind of up the, uh, up the ramp into a different kind of science and get different kind of data. I think we need to keep we need to keep room for discovery driven science and not think everything has to be big scale hypothesis driven. So some of the constraints are the emergent domain, and because the IODP is not just for this domain, there's a limit to how much they can influence the kinds of data that would come from IODP. So we're going to have a lot of interactions in these kinds of sciences. So this is one thing we've uh, been writing some papers on. But we've got one that came out just uh, last year in Peer J Computer Science uh, called um, Ship Space to Database, where we compared some of these questions about reuse versus uh, reproducibility. And you know, the reuse is, is the more obvious. The reproducibility is, is risky uh, because you're, you're, you may be enforcing standards so somebody else can do exactly the same thing over again. When you're talking about observational data as opposed to lab data, you can never really do completely completely the same thing over again. And you may be borrowing, borrowing standards, borrowing practices, borrowing tools that may match well, they may match not so well, uh, or they may just be premature. So uh, we're encouraging people to think much more about reuse of data, recombination of data, ask new questions, than about reproducibility per, per se. You, know, you get the sort of public idea that reproducibility is the gold standard of science, and I think that tends to undermine the need for, for discovery approaches to science, which is still very important. Let me spend just a few minutes talking about publications and the way in which publications and data tie together in ways that you might want to be thinking about the, about the infrastructure. Again, astronomy is an area where they built something called the Astrophysics Data Service, or data system, uh, in the early 1990s. And now they, they, again, have a more coherent, more, more bounded set of journals. But they've indexed everything in one place and then tied it to data and tied it to the observations. We're moving away from thinking about publications as these PDFs that you know, some of us still like to mark up and uh, scribble on and assign to our students, uh, to something that itself is a network that you want to mine, you want to combine, you want to think about this as the packaging. But so much of the data in many of these fields is locked up in PDF tables inside these publications. A few people are working at you know, trying to scan, throw some machine learning at it, trying to dig them out of there, uh, but with you know, a fairly high error rate, at least now, of making sense. You've still got people who are pulling PDF tables or old print tables and taking a ruler and a chalk mark to them to try to figure out what, what the data points really were. <coughs> Another problem with locking up the data in the publications 
is that you don't have a one-to-one -one mapping between a particular data set, a particular science project, and any individual data. It may be sliced and diced in many different ways. Multiple projects may come together into one paper. One paper may be part of multiple projects and, and so on and so forth. So this, on the one hand, you do need the paper to validate the, uh, the data, but at the same time, it's not just that one-to-one. -one. This comes out of some of the work with, with data citations, comes through CoData and the others. Uh, the data citation started by saying, oh, let's just map bibliographic citation to data. And that turns out to be not an easy mapping either because data and publications are simply not the same thing. At least if you pick up a publication, pick up a journal article, you should be able to read the four corners of it and you, you kind of know how you negotiate who's first author, who's last author, who's corresponding author. With data, they're compound objects. You need to think about a data set, about software, protocols, research questions, those other pieces to make sense of it. The ownership isn't very clear. Uh, the University of California claims ownership on all the data from all of its investigators and graduate students. Uh, that's not widely known or recognized by most of the investigators and graduate students. Uh, and it usually only comes up when someone goes to court over these things. Uh, it doesn't mean they're taking responsibility for them, but it means that if someone tries to take exclusive uh, rights to a data set to another university, that's about the time you may find out who really owns these data. Uh, it, it's in the fine print in your contract with NSF, but it was part of it. I think it's the G7 page A53. I cited it in one of the books of where it actually is. So you know, the, at, the attribution is, uh, is, is pretty messy. The long-term responsibility is the PI, but often if you want to reuse the data, it's the postdoc, it's the graduate student, it's somebody else that you need to talk to to make sense of it later. Uh, Research Data Alliance that a number of you are involved in has uh, been one of the drivers around moving towards some common principles. Uh, again, the devil, the devil is in the details, but this is a nice high-level set of principles. Part of what's useful for it is, it is it's an overarching framework that says data should be findable or discoverable, accessible, which means you could locate it and you could get your hands on it, interoperable, which means you need to know enough about it that you can interpret those data and make sense of them, and reusable by other people. Now, none of those are easy to do, but at least it's a target to shoot at. And it's a way of thinking about not only humans who might be searching for things and ending up on a landing page, but the robots that we're increasingly using to go find data for us and work together. Many of the, uh, many if not most, of the domain repositories are still set up assuming a human is sitting at the screen and can read a landing page and can find things. So we're moving toward a much more machine discoverable new kind of environment and the major repositories around the world are, are on board with the fair principles of trying to find ways to, to bring those together. <coughs> Metadata is, is a piece of that. <laughs> Jason Scott, whose name has fallen off the page here, is at the, uh, the Internet Archive, and he's one of the wonderfully radical um, archivists. He's one that we brought in for our um, inauguration day that uh, Steve Dinks was part of, too, at UCLA, of um, trying to <coughs> save climate data. That's about the only way he got through his inauguration day this year, was there were a lot of people in the room working on climate data and bringing it together and watching some stuff go down in, in real time. So there's many definitions of metadata. Again, the, the credit is small on the screen here. This is from NISO, the National Information Standards Organization. But it's, there's many different kinds of metadata. These are the, the three general categories. Metadata expertise is not the same as scientific expertise, uh, but a lot of us are trying to get that expertise more into graduate education, in the sciences, in the domain, to get people to think about their data as their assets from the beginning of their career and then that they may think more about uh, taking care of them. Um, identity and persistence, I won't go into those in any detail. Um, Ruth Stewart, Ruth, where are you? I see you back there. Um, Ruth is the first author on a very good piece about earth science and, and persistent data that uh, I would encourage you to read if you haven't already. Um, a couple things from that and from other work in this area is 
to think about what data are going to be persistent. Now, some of your data are really going to be, they're going to be scrap, stuff that goes on scratch disks. It's temporary, it's interim processing data. We can't keep everything, so work on the criteria for what to keep is part of a community process that needs to go on. So you're going to invest in putting digital object identifiers, ARCs, any of the, and any of the other kinds of descriptors on your data for the ones that are worth keeping. Now, you also need to recognize that assigning a permanent, persistent, and unique identifier does not guarantee that the data that are described will be permanent. The identifier might be permanent. The namespace might be permanent. The, may, the namespace might survive, but it's a different investment than investing in your data per se. So they need to be in a repository. They need to be a place that you can point to them. Provenance is another piece of this. Uh, it's a very, very old concept in libraries and archives and museums and philosophy and culture. Is so where did something come from? How do we trust it? What is it? Uh, what's the chain of custody for it? But that chain of custody idea is also now being built into technology. There's something called the FOB standards that, um, uh, I think, yeah, those, those made it on the screen. Is uh, the Provenance standards, the World Wide Web Consortium. We've got nice standards and nice practices that you can apply. Yolanda Gill is one of the, um, uh, Yolanda and Paul Groth, uh, among the people who helped build these in the first place. So you've got the expertise between Yolanda and the, and the others here on bringing those pieces together. Um, we can share the data in many different ways. And it's tempting just to put them up on your, your website. Uh, but that's not exactly something that will be persistent, sustainable, uh, resilient over, over long periods of time. One of our research themes through our current research project is to look at questions about centralized or decentralized data production is uh, and data analysis and reuse. In astronomy, particularly in areas like the sky survey, you've got a, a very centralized process where a committed group of teams uh, acquires data over a long period of time and then curates it and maintains it. Even there, it's challenging because the funding agents, and I'm going to look at NSF here, have much more of an orientation toward maintaining those data while there's active data collection. But those data may be useful for years or decades beyond the end of data collection. And that's one of the big policy questions we're working on. We, I was part of the, the uh, big facilities uh, workshop of, of about 18 months ago on trying to think about how do you keep those data alive for another decade or two beyond the end of a career because there's different kinds of national investments, international investments that need to be made well beyond the end of individual research projects. You know, what EarthCube should be doing is thinking not just about getting the data together that you've, that you've acquired, but getting them together and coordinating across the community so these data will be useful to the next generations, including generations not yet born. And that's not just a technical problem, it's not a science problem, it's also a national information policy problem and international policy problem to be dealt with. So you can, uh, you can do centralized production, put them in a data archive. There's certainly some kinds of things in our sciences like that. Other uh, ones we see a lot in, geno in genomics where individual labs are collecting data. You bring it together later. That's a lot of what we try to do in SEMS with, uh, li with limited uh, success. Uh, you've got the domain independent aggregators. Often the universities are going to be the ones that are going to take those precious little data sets that don't have another don't have another up home. We also find quite the challenge uh, when you think about uh, data sets that are mixed from very different domains. One example I'll give you from uh, something that one of my student groups was working with a year or two ago was a group from engineering and from uh, biological science, biomedical sciences, and uh, public health. And they had instrumented taxis in the city of Los Angeles to try to see what kind of air pollution people were exposed to inside the taxi and outside the taxi. They took blood samples and other uh, respiratory information from the drivers as well as loaded them up into instrumentation. The medical data were under the HIPAA privacy standards, the things you all sign when you go to medical, uh, your medical offices. The engineering data were completely different. Any domain repository that wanted the engineering data said, we can't touch HIPAA, we're not certified for it 
and the ones who would take give the data had no idea what to do with engineering data. So you don't really want those data sets to be separated, but we've got to find ways to be interoperable so you could bring them back together and compare them over time. And again, that's one of the things that we're, um, that we're trying to figure out. And the share privately on request, uh, that's one from a, a paper that we put in uh, PLOS One, again, a couple of years ago, that's gotten a lot of attention, where often people will trade data sets side to side with somebody they trust, and that's effective to get the science done, but it doesn't scale. So to build infrastructure, you need to think about scaling. And you need to think about scaling over a very long term. Okay. It's hard enough to reuse your own data if you haven't touched it in a while. Um, your collaborators, as we saw in SEMS, uh, to bring those data together. Uh, colleagues, the farther away you get from the point of origin, whether you're talking about distance in domain, distance in time, distance in instrumentation, in software, the harder it is to bring those data back together again. And with Earth science data, you want to be thinking in a very long term over very complex systems. And not just the reuse of those data sets individually, the ability to recombine them, aggregate them, uh, mine them in new ways. I think the interoperability is going to be absolutely key when we're thinking about Earth science data. Uh, how many of you have any background in economics? I don't see, I don't think I see, I sort of see one tiny little hand waving. Yeah. Way, way back there, okay. Um, the economics of science, the economics of information, something else is going on here when you want to think about uh, what kind of infrastructure to build. I won't take you through the, the, the detail much here, uh, but to note that uh, in the information economics, people think along these two dimensions. Subtractability or rivalry is how much does it take away if somebody else has it? One person can have this table, one person can have this car, and nobody else has it. How, the the exclusiv exclusivity is how hard is it to take, keep people away from it? Can you, you can't keep people away from a sunset, but you can keep people away from a proprietary journal, for example. So what's going on here is different ways of handling data, handling information. And the example that I use in the book is a genomic data set. You could produce this data set and you could throw it out in the public domain, put a CC0 license on it, and say anybody can use it for whatever they want. Now, that may get out there, but people aren't necessarily going to trust it if nobody's taking responsibility for it. You can make it a club good by putting it in a proprietary data source and it gets sold by a publishing company. Um, you can make it a private good uh, by locking it up some way, or it might be proprietary data, maybe it was built, maybe it built, belongs to a pharmaceutical company, or you can make it a common pool resource. And a common pool resource is something that is contentious enough that it needs to be governed. And that's usually the case with scientific data. You've also got the free rider problem. Somebody has to pay for the cost of building and managing and keeping and sustaining access to these data. And it's something that's very hard to do on a volunteer basis. You really need some kind of an institutional framework, some people are responsible for these data over the long term. Otherwise, you're going to find, you know, these 10 people paid for it, they got it up, but then everybody else wants to come along and use it for free and not put the money into it. There's many, there's subscription models, there's uh, universities who pay for things, there's funding agencies to pay for things, there's many different models, but generally, I think we're at a critical time of building common pool resources. If we don't make our scientific data, particularly our Earth data, common pool resources now, we risk having them privatized and going into private sectors. A whole lot of uh, publishing organizations that are moving into the data world, they see this as their next stream. So you want to think very much about who's going to have access to these over the long term, under what conditions and who's going to govern them. So to wrap up, these are some of my suggestions of how these things may apply to, uh, to EarthCube. Uh, what's cut across these, that maybe should be the headline, is don't try to build infrastructure from scratch. You know, think about how you can build upon the infrastructure that exists, knit those things together, build networks. It's going to be string and bailing wire. Some things are going to survive, some things aren't. Uh, finding the right level of abstraction. You don't want to build lots of little tiny silos. 
but you also don't want to build something generic, so generic that it's all things to all people. Because all things to all people rarely works well for anyone involved. The fair principles are, you know, again, they're, they're a grand set of goals, but they're ones that uh, a number of people have thought about these questions for a long time, has come up with. There's a lot of specifics in there. Repositories, funding agencies around the world are trying to implement those. It seems like a good bandwagon to get on. Invest in your data early. The earlier you think about it, this, these are long-running conversations Yolanda and I and others have had about if you think about making your data reusable for yourself, you're more likely to make them reusable for other people in the longer term. So new kinds of tools and services. We certainly want to sustain access. We want those data to be sustainable. We want to steward them. It's not enough to back them up because they, they will degrade and they may not be useful without the software that was associated with them. And that's where in some of our new questions are going is the software sustainability that goes with the data. If you don't have the software and you've got things like MATLAB that are upgraded uh, several times a year uh, or you're running proprietary data and you don't really know what the algorithms are behind them, the open source will give you uh, more transparency about what's going on in your data, but that has its own set of issues in terms of maintenance and, and management and skill sets. So investing in those, in the data and in the documentation, you want not just the, the data, the metadata, the programs, the obvious things, uh, the research questions, knowing why some data were collected can be just as important as knowing what were, what were collected as far as making sense of them later. I think that's also something that's not, uh, that's not understood when you go back and look at just uh, very automated kinds of data management. The protocols, the instrumentation, the calibration settings can be very important. The, there's a lot of information that doesn't even make it into journal articles that is important to being able to interpret data later in the software. So we're back to our beautiful planet Earth and uh, the reason to keep those data and to manage them. And as many people have said, and we're getting a lot of signs around the Earth Day and the other parades that um, there, there is no planet B. I mean, this is, we've got to take care of what we've got. And we're trusting you folks who've got the data to keep those data and make them useful for the generations to come and be able to ask new questions that we haven't even begun to formulate yet using today's data and the data of yesterday. So, thank you. So, so we have time, about 10 minutes for questions right now uh, for Christine, and then we're going to have a break for a little bit. Um, and so if people want to ask her things, please raise your hand. I, guess I, I trust you. She okay, let, let, me, let me do that. <laughs> uh, there's one in the room. And there are microphones through the room. Yeah, so why don't you come up to the microphone, line up in a reasonable way. Good. I, I, like, I like to walk around, but I didn't have a lot of lavalier mics. That's why I said stay, stay close. Okay, so you can hear me. Yes. My name is Jesper Gallo. I'm from the John Hopkins University of Applied Physics Lab. I loved your talk. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> not even being polite, I'm really mean. So I come from the research end, not so much for the computer end. And I've really learned at these meetings two things that I have lots to learn about computer science, and two, that we are a very diverse group. So when we use a term like data, it doesn't mean anything. Right. <laughs> and it really, I mean it, it means nothing. Let me give you an example. I'm again from the solar terrestrial physics. So we typically have a satellite. On this satellite, there's an instrument. That provides some voltages, this instrument. That's what you would call level one and level zero data. That needs to be converted into some physical quantity. For example, a magnetic field. So that's calibration, that's complicated. So that would be level one. Now this magnetic field may be due to some kind of a process like an electrical current flowing. So we use Maxwell's or something, lots of assumptions. That would be the next level. Can I have then, you turn that into a question? Yeah, it will be. There are multiple levels here. So what I'm concerned about is that each of these steps, that there are multiple steps used to get to some kind of a quantity that a scientist can use. They're all based on assumptions. 
They cannot be easily described by metadata. In fact, I would claim it's impossible. Also, it may make me real concerned about how you do the reusability because each of these steps are based on maybe hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Right. So what do we do with those two things? Okay, so these are where we get into things that are somewhat domain specific, and we've been working with your colleague Alex Ali for many years um, around the astronomy data and Sloan Digital Sky Survey. NASA has those four levels, which, which are well understood in that domain, but those those four levels are different than the, probably you know what than what you're using. Um, that's one of those difficult questions. That's why I put up you know what do you need to say? Uh, what we see in astronomy is uh, often a, an effort to try to save all four of those levels. Most of the people want that, that level four, those highly reduced data, and they do their science from those. And they may compare data from uh, multiple telescopes. They might take it from Hubble, they might take it from Sloan, they might take it from multiple other places and bring it together. But then we've also got scientists who want to go back to that level zero, the first raw data right off the satellite, off the signals, and they want to run their own pipelines. So this is an expensive question uh, of, you know, do you keep all four levels of those data? Because different kinds of science are going to be done off all of those. Uh, CERN, the physics lab, throws away, you know, we're, we're told 99.99% of those data. But, you know, they're holding up a filter. They're looking for the Higgs boson or whatever they're looking for. And the rest of it kind of goes away. And you can't get back to it later. This is the, you know, this is the problem that the early decisions are made early. I want to take Kristen, or Kirsten, and then I want to take this fellow. I know we've, we've got a lot of questions and a lot of time. Yeah, this is fun. Um, you mentioned in your last uh, slide and recommendation for us to, to investment in domain knowledge as well. Uh, while at the very beginning of the talk, you mentioned that the government finds interested to, to deal with the question of data repositories or the many applications and the many domains and situations out there. So how can we balance and how can we kind of consolidate uh, the data infrastructure while still maintaining the domain-specific curation that, I mean, I've been thinking about that quite a bit and I would be interested in your opinion on that. Well, and Kirsten, you were also part of that. Uh, one of the Alex uh, Salak was, was the PI for it. We did about 18 months ago. Um, there's another one coming up. And, uh, and I assume there's another, another one coming up in, in the same series. So there's certainly a lot of pressure. There's a lot of people, you know, you and me and Alex and many others, trying to work with NSF and, and other agencies. But you, you find different models in Europe, which you would, you would know well also. Uh, for example, some of the British models, they will stand up a repository and every grant that goes from that funding agency, the data must be offered to that repository by the end of the granting period. It's part of the initial contract. Uh, there's others where, like even the, uh, so the ESRC, the uh, Economic and Social Research Council in Britain works differently than the EPSRC, the Electronic Physical Science and Research Council, whatever. Um, that, that one, where they more required individual universities to set up repositories as a condition of getting the funding. Some of the ones on the on the continent, the European Commission, um, and the Euro European or the European Council is different from the way it's run here because they are both funding agencies and policy agencies. So if the official policy of the European Commission is open data, they then they, they can then implement and require that as a condition of funding. And because the governments have said that's a long-term view, they can make longer-term commitments. Okay. I mean, Australia is making longer-term commitments. So part of what we're trying to do is, is push the US agencies um, up against what some of the other countries have done in taking the longer view. But there's a fundamentally different way in which science is funded in the US to which it's funded elsewhere. So it's, but science is global. Science is not nation, nation by nation. So we're trying to get more coordination. Thank you. Hi, uh, lovely talk, uh, and uh, I just enjoyed it a lot. And I actually know what bailing, bailing wire is in your head. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so I, it's clear you have a commanding view over uh, at a level of generality that I rarely get to encounter. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, at the risk of opening a chasm under all our feet here, uh, you brushed by um, an old trope called the scientific method. 
Oh, yeah. And I wonder if uh, that will uh, give you an optimization to begin to think about what an update to that might look like in the era that we're in when data is the new oil and commercial uh, yeah, yeah. applications are actually starting to dwarf the, the plotting, scholarly, public funded you know, world of all this. And, uh, you know, what's, what's the landscape ahead? Uh, what's the landscape ahead? Uh, well, we don't have another 45 minutes, so we'll try to keep it short on this one. Um, you know, certainly, the, and, and that's part of what the Center for Good Network Sensing was all about, is that you've got new kinds of instrumentation and different volumes of data. So, you know, moving from, you know, what you could get off the swamp um, in, with the graduate students out there, you know, with, with, with the mosquito nets on, to what you can get by very large scale instrumentation is not just more of the same, it's a much different kind of scale. You can no longer have the human inspection. So you have different kinds of assumptions, different kinds of methods as you as you move into the space. So again, that's the kind of questions that we're asking. You're also much more dependent on software than you were on uh, when you move into this space. So part of what you know we what we think needs to happen is you get people to think about data. And as the other fellow, well, I hope we can continue that conversation um, at the break, uh, was saying about the you know the levels of data is you know can we get graduate students can we get courses in the beginning of the phd where the methods is not just this is how we've always done it and the uh in fact a lot of sciences do not have courses in research methods as explicitly as the social sciences do it's, mm -hmm. it's much more of an apprentice model in many ways so whether it's the apprentice model or whether it's bringing data science classes into the graduate courses in science if we can get the new generation to think about their data as their assets for their career, because those are assets that can be bartered, they can be exchanged, they're a way into new collaborations, they're a way to get the name known with really great citations to your data set as the best one out there. It's getting people to think about, it. it's part of what we're happening in this space is moving from data as process. I mean, data's been around for way longer than these last 10 or 20 years of big data. It's moving from process to think about data as product. So if they start to think about this product, that changes the way you think about your research methods. And yes, if I put the in front of method, I'm sorry, I did not intend that. <laughs> because it is, it's a very large class of things. Let's get this gentleman in the blue. Okay, um, so you introduced uh, quite nicely the, re the reasons why people should uh, share data. And I guess I was thinking that there's another one that's important that's possibly part of your metrics that you didn't list, and that's to collaborate. Right. Um, with you, and perhaps calling that out directly. So making it directly of immediate value for people to put data into a system and collaborate and join the research. Right. And, and we often find that that's one way people will find collaborators is by finding, uh, you know, finding data sets that are compatible or worth reusing. Uh, but let me add sort of a, a caveat to that. We also find where people are willing to release their data and they want to put constraints on it where they'll only release it to somebody whose questions are compatible with theirs or if they can approve the publications before they're released, which is not really the way sharing works. Okay. I mean, just as once you publish something, and put it out there, people are going to shoot at it. And you know, if they get if the newspaper gets your name right, you're doing well. <laughs> so same thing, you know, you've got to be able to trust in the data, put it out there, and realize there's going to be problems with people cherry picking data. And I think this is again one of the kind of pushbacks we need to be thinking about is when people cherry pick and say, ah, oh, your data said this, which is not at all what you intended. You know, what is your responsibility to respond? I've also had people say, we don't share data because we don't want to spend the rest of our careers cleaning up after other people and misinterpreting it. So it's, it's a change in scientific practice to think about data as not something that is purely your own, this is your children that you get to keep complete control over. So you know, these models that say, you know, we're investing in data, we're investing in science for the world, not just for your own career. It's a different, it's just a different way of thinking. And it's, you know, there's a new generation that's starting to think about, about a sharing economy. They may not want to buy a house, they may want to keep renting, they may not want to buy a car, they want to use Uber and Lyft. Um, I think it's, there's a certain kind of a sharing economy that's coming along. Uh, but I think we're also going to see some pushback 
because if you read if you read the fine print of the Holdren memo, and if you read the fine print of some of the European Commissioner on the open data, they're also thinking in terms of new industries being developed on top of open data as being something good for the economy. And that's going to make some people very uncomfortable also, because it's one thing to say we're all sharing data with each other for the common good, and it's something else to say somebody saw something in these data that I didn't see, or they combined my data with somebody else's data, and they create a new product that became the next Google, and I didn't get a piece of it. So there's a lot of economic issues to be sorted out. And again, I think that's the kind of thing that could go back into, uh, into the graduate training. A bit of economics, a bit of the policy, a bit of what, what the sharing economy really means as a new way of doing science. And that, that, that's where we're going, and that's, that's where we need to go. Uh, and if you, you know, if you try to license your data, you may be able to license it depending on what your uh, university does, but it may not hold up in court. Because the, you know, the observations that a court, inter a court interprets as facts, uh, like observations of time and temperature and so on, a court may treat as facts and not copyrightable. So even if you license them, they may say, sorry, no, those are facts, they're not copyrightable. There's a lot of new territory here. And a lot of things that, you know, a group like EarthCube, where you've got this, you know, these different communities coming together, should be in a position to think about. So I hope you've got some of those policy issues as you, as you move through the infrastructure questions for the rest of today. And, uh, and John, tomorrow will take you about light years farther than what I'm trying to take you today of thinking about the problems. Okay.